welcome to another My Outlander Purgatory Recap. This week, we continue our Season 5 coverage with a recap of Episode 505, Perpetual Adoration. Ready? Then pour yourself a wee dram, settle in, and let's do this! Hi everyone! Hi everyone! I'm Tracy. I'm Carol. And we are my... Outlander. Purgatory. What's that? You're like, yeah. <laughs> I'm fixing already. Uh, Carol, your hair. I don't. I'm. I'm. Fair warning. I'm just gonna. I feel very like close. Like the air is close. Do you know what I mean? When I say close, it um, just feels yeah. Like in me. July. Is it 98 damn degrees? No, it's not 98 damn degrees, but it was... I actually left the house today. I'm turning this up just a little bit. I left the house today for the first time since Sunday when I got back from Carol's house, because we were at Carol's house last weekend. I had not left the house since Sunday. Um, For me, self-quarantining is called always working at home, (laughs) working remotely. I self-quarantine every day. So I left the house for the first time today and I went to the store and it was 70 degrees out. I know that was weird. And I didn't have a coat or anything. Um, totally, so, but, but totally, it just, totally weird. you know, you just feel like sometimes like it, the air is close and everything's just like touching you. And so I'm sorry right now. I'm telling you right now, here's going to be today. Here's going to be today. The sleeves are rolled up. Windows are open. Barrette's over there. Whatever. Carol, how are you? This has been quite a week, huh? my god i can't i just can't you guys um, I, it's, it's, I, i'm sorry we're like living the walking dead carol corona you <laughs> it's like the, it's like the walking dead you guys without the zombies this is just really really weird i mean this is for we're we're this is how we're doing our friday nights you guys this is like it's it's 10 06 right now on friday night and you know while the rest of the world I don't really think they're clubbing, but like on normal circumstances, people would be clubbing. We were sitting here in front of our computers talking about Outlander. Um, um, I just want you to know that in normal circumstances, I wouldn't be clubbing. <laughs> <laughs> no, nor would I. But, you know, I might have gone out to dinner or whatever. We, we didn't. We had uh, delivery in. But it's just been... So, so, yeah, so it's Friday. Yesterday was the day that was just weird it was started crazy. out like that everything was happening and it ended up that nothing was happening oh my God. everything in the world was canceled um and it's for everybody's safety but like boy it's just it's really weird it's really weird um yeah i don't know carol are you self-quarantining are no. you are you are you practicing social distancing First of all, I'm in my house all the time too. <laughs> but no, I went out to breakfast this morning. <laughs> I mean, look, it is what it is. I I I had a cold or I had what I thought was a cold and I went to the doctor yesterday and it turned out it was allergies and she was like, Yeah, you need better nasal spread. Bye. Um, I know. Well this is the thing with the coronavirus. You know, they they, they keep saying it's it's flu like symptoms, coughing and fever and uh, 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 shortness of breath. But I need more details. You know how Tom Hanks has it now, and his wife Rita Wilson. I need yeah. them to update us constantly on how they're feeling. What's their temperature? Tom Hanks needs to take his temperature once an hour and Instagram story that shit because I need to know. I had this weird thing on Monday and Tuesday where, um, and again, I, I'm sure it is because we were at your house. Third Sister Jill was there over the weekend. We didn't get any sleep. We, like, ran around, you know, like wild, crazy ladies. We ate all sorts of crap. We drank like fish. We were wild, crazy ladies. We were wild, crazy ladies. So by Monday night, I'm sure that my body was like, stop this, please. Stop this madness. Um, and I had a weird fever. Um, and it got up to like, I don't know, 101, maybe in the middle of the night, something like that. And I was fine in the morning and I, you know, did my work. And then Tuesday night, same thing. 
like weird fever, not quite as high, but went away in the morning and hasn't been back. But of course you're thinking like, oh my God, I got the coronavirus. <gasps> oh my God, this is it, this is it. But who would know? Because is it like, is the coronavirus a really high fever? Is it like a mild, you know, low grade fever? I don't think it's, I don't think it's coming and going if you have it. I think you have the fever, you have the fever. I haven't heard about the fever coming and going. But um, I, I'm sorry, I'm not paying attention to any of it. I've read a million different things. Some people say they the cough was horrific. Some people say they never had the cough. I, no, just no, just no, just enough, everyone, enough. I'm done. I just I can't. Know. I'm just so like, ugh. Look, just be smart and wash your freaking hands. I know. I said one good thing comes out of this. It'll be that people start washing their hands. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? What are you drinking? Or do I have to ask? Or did you get something new? Celebrate the occasion. While I was somewhat quarantining, I quarantined myself in the liquor store today. Can we just say this too? Can I just interject one thing? Um, you know, everybody's showing these these like brawls at the grocery store and these empty tape toilet paper aisles. Nobody's talking about the fact that like was the wine store I empty? Was the liquor store. I was at the liquor store. Was it let? Was it empty? Were the shelves empty? Because that's where I would go. I was like, F that. I have plenty of toilet paper. I'm going to buy some wine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so my sister-in-law, Patty, told me that she had um, Sauvignon Blanc at uh, Thanksgiving. Mm. And she was like, if you're going to, it's really yummy. It's very grapefruity. And she was like, if you're going to have it, make sure you get it from Marlboro, New Zealand. Okay. What's what's the um, name of it? I don't, I, how do I pronounce that? Oh, oh, I think I've had that. Matua or Matua? I think it's going to be my summer drink. And I'll tell you guys why. If you're into a fruity, light wine, I think I'm going to put a little seltzer in this, maybe a piece of fruit or two. I think it's, it's my summer drink. Wine. What? It's a sangria wine. What? It's a good sangria wine. I, I And I was like, you know what? I can't have Tracy make fun of my, my Santa Margarita. And I'll tell you what else. I was in my local liquor store today, one of a few. Um, I mean, I wasn't in a few. I was in one of, anyway. Um, <laughs> oh my God, the Santa Margarita was $29. It's coronavirus price gouging. I'm sorry. Have, you seen, <laughs> have they seen the stock market lately? I cannot afford $29 wine. I can't. That, what is so, it? Was it like a special vintage or something? No, well, some stores it's it'll be like twenty four, twenty. Sometimes you can get it. The the Costco, the liquor store next to Costco, I bought it once a few years back, and they had it for like twenty one. I think I've so, seen nineteen ninety nine on a I, special sale. Ma, if you see Santa Margarita for nineteen ninety nine, you better tell me because I need to stock up because that's what I drink. But anyway, long story short, I think I'm getting a little into. Yeah, the Sauvignon, I like it. It's just fruity and crisp. It is good. It's a little, like, a, I think I, because I think I drank that last week, and I said that it's a, it's in the, it walks the champagne line without going over it, because it's a little, it's a little fizzy. It's not champagne-y fizzy, but, and I'm not, like, yeah. a big bubbly person, but on, yes, yeah, so on a hot summer day, a really good, cold, crisp Sauvignon Blanc is very good. Um, I'm drinking yet Tracy, another. what are you drinking? A, a yet another Goupon wine, which is. Princess Joy Joyous, Princess Joyous, and it's a basically 2017 white wine. Um, can I ask you a question? What? I don't usually drink the screw off. Like, can I still put my my rubber? No, I would do the screw off is better. Why? Because it it's tighter. It holds the air out better. You don't need the I'll thingy in there. The air out. I'm gonna, you guys. I'm gonna because I'm crazy like that. It's nutty. That's nutty. It's um, nutty. It's corny. I will oh, admit to fruity. kind of in my, in my like, what do we really need to hunker down here? Do we have enough wine? Yeah. That's yeah. all I can. <laughs> all right. Now I'm serious. You guys don't be like, oh my God, those girls are terrible. All they care about is drinking when it's the coronavirus. Um, first of all, Tracy, we better hurry up because we don't want to take too long in the beginning. <laughs> oh, that's true. Somebody, well, whatever. Fast forward, fast forward. But we are here to cheer you up. We are here to bring joy because um, we bring you joy, much like 
Maria Kondo, she would not toss us because we bring you joy, so you're going to keep us. Tracy, we spark joy. We Marie, spark joy. We spark we joy. Spark joy. I hope we're sparking your joy, you guys. Um, all right. We take the coronavirus seriously. We're just being like, you know, trying to be whatever. Um, Carol and I have not talked about this episode at all. Not one word. Um, this is perpetual adoration. Um, they explain what that is if you're not Catholic or old. Um, they explain what that is pretty well in the show. It's when they have you, like, I think they'll do it back then. I guess maybe they used to do it all the time. I think they only do it during Lent now, or maybe like during from like Holy Thursday to Easter. I don't know. I was like, is it Lent or Advent? Um, I, but they still have those. They look like a big sun with the, with the host in the middle of it. And that's, they put the host in the middle, which is Jesus. And, put it on the altar and that's the perpetual adoration and somebody has to stand guard all the time. Um, so that's what that's about. But yeah, we haven't talked about this episode at all, but this pat, like we're doing this on Friday because I couldn't do it on Thursday because I'm on the board of a theater here and I do the publicity. So I just spent last night and we were supposed to have a show open tonight, which of course was canceled because the facility was in lockdown. Um, so I had to spend last night, updating all the online stuff that the show was canceled and big mess, big mess, big mess. So Carol actually watched this a second time, this episode and took copious notes. And I, I sort of buzzed through it a little, I buzzed through it a little while ago and took a few notes, but Carol's really driving the train on this one. Why do you have to eat? Like what? I'm excited. I'm excited to flip the script here. I'm excited. Tracy appointed herself the train driver a long time ago. I didn't so. appoint myself. I just we we have said this before. I think of it. I have to. I have to do it narratively. It's just it's too hard for me to jump all over the place. Um, that's my one concession to all of this. It's like I got to talk it through like that because I will just be lost. But anyway, all right. So we haven't right. talked about this at all. I I don't have my iPad with it going because usually I watch it while we're talking, but I wrote all these notes and I made sure to get every single scene. Um, do you, you, do you, Tracy, want to your, you. do you want to give your initial impression of this episode? Cause we haven't talked about it at all. Uh, they had me crying again. Freaking damn it. This, this episode, this whole season is very much, there's a lot of weird, like, First of all, anybody who's married, this episode was, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There was a lot of mentions of marriage and, and, um, yeah, it just got me a lot. It got me. I cried. I laughed. I cried. I felt every emotion. You liked, I, you, you liked um, Graham Menzies, did you not? Uh, for, I, I could tell them that. Graham Tobias Menzies. First Graham of not all, Tobias Menzies. <laughs> first of all, I know. Was his name Graham Menzies? Yes, I looked it up. I, just, I looked it up just before we started. The Graham Menzies in the book, it's a slightly different character, and I think it's somebody that Claire helps helps him to die. I'm all tangled up. Um, I don't remember exactly, but he's he's not. There is a, there is some reason, like some patient. I don't know. I don't remember. There is some patient that she ends up taking a sabbatical over because she screwed something up. I'm not, I don't remember if this was the guy or not. Um, cause I think this guy, she helps to, she helps to, helps him to die. All right. Well, I'm going to get to him when I get to that part in the notes. Cause I've wrote stuff down. Um, I thought this episode was very good too. I, I think the thing that I really liked about this episode, not, and again, I liked the last two episodes. I liked crazy town and I liked Brownsville a lot, but they were all about people who were not our part of our little world. And this episode, we were back on the ridge um, we were, we had scenes with Claire and Roger and scenes with Claire and Marsley and scenes with Claire and all the little Ridgeites. And, you know, I mean, and then, then there were, yes, there were the Jamie and the lefty scenes, but, um, then we had some good Jamie and Claire scenes and it, I just liked being home like that. And Brie and Roger had a lot of good scenes. Um, it felt like we were home again, which I really liked. There's some things in this episode that I thought were, uh, I need to talk through as well. But we'll get to those, I guess. Um, all right. 
So the cold open, back to a cold open. It is 1968 Claire and Church. My God, I loved it. I loved seeing Claire back in the 60s. Uh, yes, I did not expect that. And I was like, I did it like a gasp. Like, oh, I never thought we would see this again. Yeah. Yeah. Love um, seeing her in the 60s. She was serving us 1964, 63, Jackie Kennedy realness all over the place. Were they Catholic? Like, I was sitting there going, why don't I remember this? Well, no. Well, yes, actually, Claire was Catholic. Yes, Claire is Catholic. I, uh, I don't know. Anyway. I, I think she is, but maybe she's lapsed a little bit. Because in the first book, you know, when they're in at the Abbey, when Jamie is um, recovering and she's talking to the abbot and, and the, the, the father, whoever... Father, um, what's his name? I don't remember his name. Um, I don't, but I, I thought I thought she was. But in any case, you don't. Yeah, you don't really know why she's there. I mean, you sort of discover it along the way. Um, but she's just in this church, and they're doing the adoration, and you're not. You don't know why. All you know is she looks fabulous. That's all. Uh, um, she always looks fabulous. No, but um, that, she just. She was just. The hair was very big. The hair was very, very, very dark helmet from Spaceballs. Um, it was very big. But she just, but I didn't care. She just, she looked so, so, so Jackie Kennedy. It wasn't even funny. Um, so yeah, so Claire's in church and I was, I couldn't remember what it's called. I mean, you know, he referred to it as like the blessed sacrament, but what is the, what is perpetual the- ad Perpetual adoration. AKA no. the title of this episode. No, AKA no. What it, I'm going to ask our Catholic school teacher sister right now. What is, and you, and whoever you guys who are seriously Catholic out there are like, I know. What is the thing on the altar with the host in it? Oh, the sun thing. What is the quote sun thing end quote on the altar during adoration question mark. All right, she was something. Okay, guys, we gotta we gotta move it on. Jeez, this has been like a half hour already. Um, Claire's sitting in the pew, looking forlorn. She's wondering how many times she's counted on God, an invisible entity that you can't hear, and wondering how many times her prayers have been answered. What do you think about that? Because I was like, is she saying that her prayers aren't usually answered, or she's truly like, I don't know how many times my prayers have been answered, and then they go right to her, I almost said her marijuana. They go right <laughs> to her and her penicillin. Now that's an idea. If I took myself back to the 18th century, <laughs> what else do you have to do? You don't have to worry about driving or anything. I think that would be or it being illegal. <clears throat> I could grow in the cannabis under the glass jars. I bet you they anyway. were growing it. What I bet you, I bet you they were growing it. I bet you, I bet you, uh, cannabis was a, a known quant entity back then. Um. Oh, I said how many lines the the whole show was the book. It was awesome. I know, I know, I know. There were so many oh, good lines. God. There were so many good there's lines. There's nothing. There's nothing like a good. She says it's called a monstrance. I don't think okay. I've heard that. Okay. No, before. I actually think that that's right. For some well, reason. Well, I actually think your sister is a Catholic school teacher and she knows that it's right. I know. Um, how weird is that? I don't remember that word. And we 12 years of Catholic school. Anyway, so um so yeah, it was so awesome. It was like just this plethora of Donna Gavaldon like like amazingness. Um so Claire's looking at the microscope. I love I love. You guys, I want to show you my messy kitchen. Because I told you I root plants all the time if I have a little piece or whatever. So I rooted plants all over my kitchen. So when I watch her in the penicillin, I'm like, I totally want to do this. And my daughter has... Grow a well, we were talking about growing penicillin, remember? Or grow oh my God, I totally want to do it. And oh yeah, with my orange too. And my daughter is a science kid. She's an anatomy kid. And um, she has 
like a serious um, microscope. So uh, we're always like, oh, let's put that other microscope. So I am loving the Claire stuff because I'm jealous. I'm jealous. I want to come up with penicillin. But here's my question. So she's looking in the microscope. She sees the penicillin. She, um, she shows Marsley. What did she, Marsley call it? Paintbrushes? Yeah. I'm sure that's what Claire told her. Like, like, cause remember when Claire was away, Marsley's job was to like, look at all the samples and see if right. any of them were penicillin. And that's how Claire told her to look for it. Like, it's going to look like a paintbrush. Okay. I guess I was like, how does Marsley know what a paintbrush looks like? I guess they, I guess a paintbrush. I think she's painted a few things before. I'm, I'm oh, don't pay- forget she knows Brie, um, Brianna Randall, comma, artiste. So. True. Very true. Um, Eureka. So, um, I said, how friggin' topical with the penicillin and like trying to, you know, cure, not cure, but, you know, make sure that people aren't dying of diseases and stuff. And then we've got all this coronavirus oh, crap going. Oh, very true. Maybe I Claire could invent some penicillin for that. Oh my God. That would be it really cool. So totally topical. Um, um, I had a question about the penicillin. So she found, so... So she has like hundreds of samples all over the big house, right? Mm-hmm. And one of these samples has made the right penicillin. Does she know like exactly what like the conditions were of that sample? I'm assuming that she's sorting all of these into this one is, um, you know, this is brown bread and this one is white bread and this is an apple and this is, and this one is wet and this one is dry and this one is in the sun and this one is in the cupboard. Like, does she, has she have, does she have all of them labeled so she can recreate this? Or is the whole point of penicillin that you don't recreate it, you just keep feeding the one that's there, like sourdough starter? Sourdough starter. <laughs> I don't know. Um, that's but, what I was thinking of through this whole thing. I was, I was like, how is she going to recreate it? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But I was like, okay, once she has it, what does she do with it? Like, what, how does she make the liquid? The goo. Well, I make, don't know. I didn't really think of that till just liquid now. Liquid in the teacup, number one. Number two, does she go, all right, this is the one. And she takes it and she puts it in something and then she just keeps letting it multiply? That, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, how do you, does she have to, does she have to grow it again on something new the exact same way? Or does she, does this one, the one she made, continue yeah. to get bigger? Yeah. And she That's keeps feeding it, it with like, with whatever, yeah. with, with yeah. more bread or more apple or whatever uh, it is. Yeah. First of all, we know she took notes because Fergus took them. Oh, so good call. Very good we call. Know, we know that she was taking notes. So we hope that she has notes on how exactly she came up with this one. Uh-huh. Each one, um, which is, I'm sure Mrs. Bug thinks is a big waste of paper and bread. Uh, so, uh, Hopefully they stole the paper from the Beardsley's house because they had a lot of it. No one's doing anything with that. That's true. That's true. So, um, yeah. So I think that she probably, though, just sticks that sucker in a glass jar and lets it go to town. Um, I have no idea, though. I would even think that, like, mold would get weird after a while, but whatever. So um, she's up in the microscope. She gets Marsley, Eureka. um, And then I have that the Easter egg was Claire going through the books on the table and picks up the proverbial trashy romance novel. And that's right from the book. That happened in the book. It happened a little differently. It's it's from Dragonfly and Amber. And I think that that's where Joe, or where Claire first meets Joe, for some reason. They're in the residence lounge or whatever. And um, <clears throat> she's just looking for something to read, and she picks that up, and he's already read it and put it there. I um, love that. I'm going to Joe. We got it. I just, because I just feel like it's my duty to say that the writer for this episode is Allison Evans and Steve Kornacki and the director is Mira Meenan. I think we might, I think she might have directed last season. If it's a she, I'm sorry if you're not a she, if you're a he, but. Um, I thought it was well done with the, with the jumping back and forth. I'm not usually a big fan of jumping back and forth because it's, it takes you out of the moment and. Yes. And not only was it jumping back and forth, but the back was all chopped up and, and rearranged because the first scene we see happened later than yeah, like, like was probably one of the last then scenes to happen. 
if right. that makes sense. Right. Yeah. I like I like the structure of it too. I like I do I do like when they I mean they obviously haven't needed to do that lately. So it was kind of cool that they figured out a way to get them back to um the future to the future and bring back Joe um to the future to the future. All right, what's next? Okay. So, um we see would it be called a montage um they're showing like difference what are you laughing at she's talking well she's talking about memories i think and um there's a lot of clair narration clairation in this episode yes but we're seeing scenes from all of the seasons and i was like oh my god this is like the end of twilight I was like, oh my God, she has to pick up on this. <laughs> it was, for those of you, I mean, well, you know, one of the cardinal rules of Mop is do not diss on, to- on Twilight. Um, I am done and <laughs> for you. <laughs> for oh, it's going to get thousand years. Yes. Oh my God. But like the last, so like we love the books and the movies were, you know, ebbed and flowed. But the last movie, the last Twilight oh. movie sucked so bad, except for the last 20 minutes, which I won't spoil them if you haven't seen it, but are really good. Not from the book and really good. Um, but then the last two minutes are from the book. And it's basically that, you know, I'm going to, I'll just say like, Edward can normally read minds. He can't read Bella's mind for some odd reason. They figure out why. And Bella does something at the very end to allow Edward to get into her mind so he can see her thinking about all of these like great memories that they've had. I want to show you something. And it basically gives them an opportunity to go back through all of the movies and do this like two minute montage of the whole story. And again, I stress that that last movie sucked. It was awful. But, and Carol and I went to see it together and you had already seen it. I hadn't seen it. I sobbed for two minutes watching that yeah. two minute montage. Sobbed. Yeah. Like racking yeah. sobs. And because Carol's not like, only it, I know. Not only was it reminding you, not only was it showing you their lives, but like, we were all invested in right. this. Right. Just like out there. Right. I mean, we were all for years I blogged about that for years. We, my God, remember my hundred days till new moon party? Yes. You yes. guys, we just, you sat in that theater and you felt it all from like five years with your friends and this and that. So that's what I loved about this in Outlander. Yes, I loved I said the, the same seasons. thing. I said yeah, the last two was, minutes of the last Twilight movie. Uh, it was just, it was, I just want that on a loop. I just want to play that whole little montage on a loop. So great. So right, great. Right. And then Claire says, um, if time, wait, 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 she's talking about ashes to ashes. And she says, if time is anything akin to God, I suppose that memory must be the devil. And I'm, that's cry number one. There's cry number one. I had to stop. I'm like, oh, Diana Galvagon, why do you have to do this to me? <laughs> I'm back with the bees. I'm back with the damn bees. Oh my God. So anyway, um, it is very true. She's just, I don't, I don't even know how this woman like just does it. I have no idea how she comes out with, it's like she can see into your soul. I am, um, I got to think that all that narration is straight out of the book. I, yeah, yes, I yes, didn't look it up, yeah. but I'm assuming that it is. Yes. So, um, okay. So, uh, Claire meets Brie and, um, tells her that she lost a patient to penicillin allergy so um, at this point, you're like, okay, so now I'm sort of getting why she's like knows about penicillin because knowing Claire, she hyper focused her way through, you know, she probably like didn't like shower for two weeks and just did nothing but stuff <laughs> penicillin. Right. So it was good. It's explaining to, you know, you, whether you read the books or not, but it, especially those who didn't read the books, you're like, oh, now I get it. Like, you know, this is why there's a reason why this woman knows about penicillin. Right. Because how is the average person going to know? She's not the average person, but whatever. Can we um, talk about what she was wearing and that dress was even better than the Jackie Kennedy outfit? Oh, uh, I want that dress so badly. I yes. can't even stand it. Talk. I, about I the loved, dr- 
everything about it the tech the texture the pattern um the color the little collar um it was so great it was just it was oh my gosh 1968 claire is just such a sharp dresser oh my gosh so, so sharp. good she's just a um, sharp dresser 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 she's not fran dresser <laughs> You guys, I'm sorry if my sound is really bad. I had issues with my computer. It's on its last leg. And Tracy very graciously waited for me to fix my Skype for like uh, 45 minutes. And um, my I have this Apple earbuds and they're not working. So, um, yeah, here I am echoing. Echo, echo. Um, so, okay. So, uh, Claire is telling Bree that she lost a patient. And she's upset about it. And then all of a sudden we go to Bree and Roger and they're in bed. And, and he's asking her, was it good? Like, I'm like, oh, Roger, just shut up. <laughs> it hurts. It hurts. <laughs> and he was like this. Oh, Bree. I'm like, am I okay at that? Or do I suck at that I'm too? Like, I'm to be a dick. Like, dude, it would be much more hot if you didn't care. <laughs> and he was he was very hot in that scene. He oh, my God. very hot in that scene. Okay, not only that, I literally have it written down somewhere. Um, Bree and Roger in bed. Is it me or does he get hotter with every passing episode? I know. He totally does. I thought the oh, same thing. I God. There's like a shot of them like close up on their faces and his face is just sort of turned on hers, kind of like like kissing sort of like here. And I was just like damn. Well, can you imagine if they got him together with Marsley? Like the acting explosion? It would be like, oh my God. Um, like the two of them, they're just so good. I, yeah, Don't you feel I, the same I, way about him as Roger as you do about her as Marcelle? Um, the only difference is that he it's had the nuance. No, well, no, it's not even that. He had to be like, like it's no surprise that he's good because he had to be good. Marcelle is not the bigger role. I mean, Marcelle's a the featured little kind of role, and especially in the first season or two, you know, she had a couple lines per episode. But she just took those lines and she, like, you know, stole the show with them. Well, that's as the big deal. You know, sometimes the people with the smaller roles are way better than the people with the bigger roles, no matter what this show is or movie. So it's I'm not very the size of the role, it's the quality of the role. That's right. So, anyway, my point is I think he's amazing. <clears throat> and she's amazing. And I went, hey, I want them to get together and have an amazing baby. Um, I okay. can't see them together, though. Oh, I'm not being serious. Okay, so let's just keep moving. So Roger talked jokes around about, no, well, he's not really joking. He's talking about how there's Harvard now and Yale. They're already established universities. Roger he, University. He starts talking about McKenzie University. <laughs> and Bree's like, that's, that's, that's what's up. I could teach math. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry. Weren't you just in math class like five minutes ago? <laughs> I would also think Bree would want to invent math, not just teach it. <laughs> yeah, she can come up with all of the new stuff. So, yeah. So, Bree now wants to teach math. So, then we show up Jamie and crew uh, coming into the next town. And Jamie, I hope Jamie jumps off a horse faster than most of us jump off the toilet. <laughs> Man, he just slid out off that horse. <laughs> um and he has a conversation with the townspeople, tells them he's looking for men to join his militia. They're a little bit non-trusting at first, but they talk to him a little bit. Then they realize he's on the up and up, and then they start bitching about the redcoats are in there doing their thing. So he goes to talk to, why can't I remember Knox's name? I call him Because we call him Lefty. He, oh, yeah. So he goes to talk to Knox, finds out that the governor has issued full pardons for everyone. Well, so far he's thinking everyone. And he's like, yeah, he's like doing <laughs> it. Um, and yeah, so they're talking about the fact that the governors are issued pardons, yada, yada. They have their little chit chat. <laughs> I have written down, sometimes Fergus looks like Mark Marceline. 
There must be something with his eyes in this one scene that he looked like Harsley. And the thing I would say is Fergus was in that scene. Um, maybe for, yeah, Fergus was standing there. Like he came We're in back with to them. invisible Fergus. Maybe Fergus is only magical in Brownsville. You guys, I want you guys to know this. And I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about the non-book readers. Somebody got upset with that recently. Um, if you, oh, we got to tell Jill this. Oh, we should get Jill on this right now. Um, if you guys, if you are not a book reader, you haven't read the books, Fergus is such, not such a huge role, but he's got so much more of a presence. And Well, we and said more, that last week, though, that he's just, he's. So when we are like, like, oh my God, Fergus, and you're probably like, what? That guy in the corner? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love Fergus so much. Like. You haven't even, you don't even know Fergus yet. You, you, the deliciousness to meet, hopefully more Fergus. Well, see, that's so the anyway. thing. Okay. I think so, that we, um, we worry sometimes that there's not going to be any deliciousness, that it's just always going to be this guy who's just kind of like in the background, like, uh-huh, uh-huh, we, 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 uh-huh. Yeah, Da-da-da. I think there is. And then in Brownsville last week, he was hot and funny and French, and we were like, we, we. And now the week he's kind of back to being like, okay, me lord, yep, whatever you say, me lord, uh huh, we uh-huh. right, but 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 I I I think there's something coming from the book that I'm going to be happy about. But anyway, <clears throat> um, so um, glad to be able to call you a friend. Oh my, like this Knox is just ugh. lefty, um, lefty, lefty. He tells Jamie that he's waiting for the prisoner rolls at Ardsmere. And Jamie's like in his head, like, <laughs> like, oh shit, now he's going to know who I am. Yeah. Um, and Jamie realizes the pardon doesn't extend to Murtaugh. How does uh, he realize that? Maybe I just watched it too fast. How does he know? How, how well, you know, it's funny because I have that written down <clears throat> in that scene. But then when they came back to it, then Jamie says it again. So I'm like, well, I thought he realized it in there. No, I don't so think I don't... so. I mean, they had that broadsheet on the he, wall. I think Jamie was, star- yes. And they were standing there. And I think Jamie was starting to realize at that point. And then when we came back, it was right after well, that. Okay. It could be one of two things. Number one. Did he say, did, did Lefty say the Tryon is going to pardon almost all the regulators or most of the regulators. I don't know. Does it matter? Well, this is what I'm saying. I'm, this this makes the point of your saying that, like, you know, in that case, Murtaugh might not have been off the table. You know? Um, I didn't get that sense that Jamie was like, well, Murtaugh's still being hunted, but Lefty doesn't know that yet. I just... I I had the sense that, that Jamie at first thought great it's all of them and then as the scenes went on realized oh shit it's not Murtaugh because his picture's still up there anyway so um then we're back to Claire and she's talking about spider webs there was a lot of discussion about spider webs and I did not write all of that commentary down I did not write down all the narration so um <clears throat> vibration in the web is it uh is time God's eternal web yeah I was a lot, very, of, a lot of web stuff yeah, skip it. Skip yeah. it. It's all but very well like, written, very interesting. I was but they're like listening to it all, like yeah, yeah. Like some of it was wow. So okay, then oh my god, we meet Graham Menzies. Graham, not Tobias Menzies. I am instantly smitten. Smitten. Oh my god, I love him. Um, and then he starts talking about his wife and then Carol has to stop watching again. I mean, and that was another thing. I was like, Oh my God, he's just perfect. Um, I have, I've died and gone to heaven. Uh, Claire explains that, um, he, his gallbladder is damaged. She's yes, has colonos- colonopoly. <laughs> I was like, she, I know she didn't just say colonoscopy. That sucker's coming out. So, and it's, it's colon. <clears throat> So, um, but I didn't look it up. I'm sorry, you guys. I didn't do that for you. It was colon, colon something or other. That meant colon, like he had an hospital. infection in his stomach. Yeah. So then he lays it on Claire that his wife passed away. Um, 
And I'm just gone, 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 gone when he says that. Then he says, um, oh, my God. I think I stopped and texted you the first time I watched it. I so, think so, too. Uh, I'm going to tell a Tom story real quick. So my husband sold medical devices for 20 plus years and he had been in pharmaceuticals and he had been in all the stuff and then he, he kind of worked his way and, and so he got this job and he was going to sell medical devices. Well, you have to go into the surgery, you have to go into the OR, you have to sometimes suit up and everything and you are standing there explaining to the surgeon how to use your actual whatever it is that they're using. And the first time Tom ever went into one of these surgeries, he and I were like, oh my God, I was like, you can do it, you can do it. And he was like, what if I can't? What if I get in there? What if I pass out? Like all of it. So he had his whole day at work and you know, I was like, oh my God, oh my God. he comes home and I go, how was it? And he goes, it was great. He goes, it was like gut in a fish. So then I watched this and sure enough, Graham Menzies tells Claire, you're going to gut me like a fish. Aww. And I'm like, oh my God. And I am six feet under at this point. Okay. So Claire, we switch to, um, Claire is, can I, are you done with that? Can I move on yes. to, um, Keziah, to yes. Kezi? So Claire is examining Kezi and realizes that he's not allergic to the penicillin because she tried some on him and he's okay. But she's nervous because as we are now figuring out, she had a problem because didn't she tell him in that one scene that she was going to have to, she would give him something and. About the yeah. Penicillin. He was going to have to have penicillin for this, for this infection that he had. Yeah. The colon. So um, she kind of shit in her pants. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, at this point I think didn't, cause she also told Brie something about a patient and penicillin at the very beginning. Right. <laughs> This is where the time, this is where the time. She told Brie in the beginning that she lost her patient and it's right. him. So you knew that there was a little bit of, and, and at this point you're figuring out like, okay, it's gotta be this guy. Right. She right. Lost. So now in the, in the past slash present day, um, when she's kind of concerned, she, you know, she's going to great pains to make sure that Kezi is not, um, allergic, but you, as she tells Marcy, you can never really be sure. Um, and you know, being a doctor is like, uh, t taking a risk every time you try to do something or whatever. So yeah, she's feeling very uncomfortable because of this prior incident that she lost a patient because she didn't realize, or I guess maybe she didn't realize or there, or there, there didn't seem to be an, an allergy. So she's going to make damn sure that there's no allergy with Kezi, but deep down she knows she can't really make damn sure. Right, and she's shitting her pants, and we just hope she has her shitting pants on. Right. <laughs> right. Anybody who watches Walking Dead will think that's funny. Um, so uh, she's like, all right, he did okay. He's not allergic. We're going to get going. And she explains to Marsley that you can't always be sure of the testing results. Kezi um, gets his shot of penicillin, which ow, 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 mofo, ow. Um, question. Where did she get that syringe? I don't know. Uh, I was thinking some, the same for thing. For some reason, I feel like those syringes may not have been easy to come by. Um, I don't know. I distinctly, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm maybe I'm mistaking something, but I'm distinctly remembering. Of something that that was needed at some point and they had to do some kind of um inventing of that to 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 of something like that to deal with a problem <laughs> um, <laughs> um oh, and, yeah. but i don't know whether it was because maybe they 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 had one, but they but they weren't able to use it for some reason. I I don't know. That's that's when I just I don't remember. But I I I saw that syringe and it was pretty nice. It was seemed like you know certainly not modern into our day or even to nineteen sixty eight, but probably but maybe modern to nineteen forty two. Um, 
I don't know. That was my question. Is, is I'm on I'm on Wikipedia, <clears throat> and they're going from an Iraqi Egyptian surgeon in the ninth century to remove cataracts. Lord. And then they're going to, it doesn't say when, pre-Columbian Native Americans created early hypodermic needles and syringes using hollow bird bones and small animal bladders. Kind of cool. Very cool. Then it jumps to 1650. Blaise Pascal invented a syringe, not necessarily hypodermic, as an application of what is now called Pascal's Law. And then it jumps to 1844. So I can't really tell you. But all I know is I took one look at that thing and I was like, Oh, uh, the needle is really, really thick. <laughs> like, oh my god! I mean, and the other, and you know, suspension of disbelief. If Claire could invent penicillin, she probably could invent a hypodermic needle, I guess. And and maybe she brought it with her with her peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Who knows? Right, and her other. But, pen- oh, that's true. She did have penicillin before. Yeah, she brought some with her. That's true. Oh, yes, yeah, she had to give it to Jamie when he got shot. Right. Right, 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 right. So maybe she had that lying around. I don't know. But again, yeah. I don't know why people would, like, wouldn't people look at it like, what's that? And she'd be like, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> now then I just made it up. Shut up, Marcy. Um, <laughs> um, so, oh, yeah. I, and I will, so, I will say, I also thought it was really funny when she's like, drop your britches. And Cassie's like, really? And then they pan over to Marcy, or to uh, Lizzie, and Lizzie's like, Okay, I was driving the train. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, thought, I, I didn't know you wrote that down. I thought we were past that part already. So, no. No, we weren't. I was going to be really funny about it, too. Okay, I was going to well, be much do funnier. It, do it, do it. What did I'm you done now. You already said it. Oh, I'll just sit over here and, like, not say anything. <laughs> no, you jumped ahead. It's cool. It's cool. I do that all yeah, the time. you, you just... You can't give me <laughs> What is that? What in the hell are you doing? What is that? What the hell did you do? I was trying to be <laughs> You said you had already talked about him getting a shot, and it, my God, it must have really hurt. And that's when it happened. So I just thought we were past that. I don't care. I have written down Kessie gets a shot of penicillin and Lizzie's all hot and bothered. And has to <laughs> so you and I, same way of life. Well, that was funny as shit. Let's be honest. I know. I know. So my girl wanted to see his butt <laughs> Um, <laughs> And then I have, I have to fast forward at this point because it's disgusting with all of the blood coming out and I'm trying to eat popcorn. I watched it the first time. But the second time I was eating popcorn, I was like, I don't need to watch that again. This is actually where we should bring in Third Sister Jill, who I'm sure is like an hour into sleeping right now. But she has had her tonsils removed. So she can probably speak to this whole process. Well, she was awake during it, but um, it's not. I I don't think she removed the whole tonsil. I think she removed, she said there was abscess. I oh, she, because I was wondering why she didn't do two of them. Why there didn't have to be two incisions. Let me tell you a little something. Here we go. I'm sorry, guys, mentioning Tom again. I, I know about tonsil surgery, and it is dangerous. And back before they, um, well, no, they would have had to gone farther. But, because, you know, back in the day, if you would get your tonsils out, whatever. It's not It's not easy surgery, and it's and it's like... There's some danger. There's a lot of risk involved in tonsil surgery. So I don't know if she just locked out the tonsils. Well, no. I mean, third sister Jill had her tonsils out as an adult or as a young woman. She was, I I think she was in college when she had her tonsils out or right after. She was. Um, But it's really, you know, you always think of it being for like when you're six and you have your tonsils out and you can eat all the ice cream you want, Carol. Um, but, But when you're an adult... It's not easy. It's really hard. And the other thing is that invariably when you get your tonsils out, you puke because you swallow a lot of blood. Now, maybe that didn't happen for Kezi because um, Claire cauterized the incision. And I don't know that they do that now. Like, do they? So you, I, I don't know. I'm not a surgeon. I just talk about them on these videos. I, I um, did a lot of 
suspending disbelief in this because come on now. He's sitting well, and he's, up. A, and he's awake for it too. Like that's awake the, oh, for that. it. She's cutting into anybody in his position would bite right the hell down on her hand. Well, and the other, well, no, she, he, she wouldn't have done that because that's why he put the cork there. Okay. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. I think he'd bite right the Wouldn't hell. Wouldn't he be choking? Court. He, she's shoving an instrument like down to here. Yes. Wouldn't he yes. be gagging yes. and choking? Yeah. All I know is one of the most famous. Oh my God. What is he? Uh, otolaryngologist. Did I say that right? Anyway, in the world works in, uh, UPenn in the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, and told me, now they do it actually with uh, the robot. They go in with the Da Vinci, and they, and they use the hands, and it's really cool, you guys. But he told me before this, he invented that, sur that type of surgery for tonsils, or for the throat, I should say. Before they used to do that, he said, uh, they used to slice you right down and pull your jaw open and get in there. So not for typical just cutting out a tonsil, but if they had to go far enough, they couldn't get in there without. So that's why I was like watching him sit up like this. <laughs> like, he's barely making a sound. Like, oh my God, just suspend the disbelief and I'm good to go. Um, so I did um, wonder if Claire washed her hands before the surgery, just because there's a whole lot of hand washing, you know, thoughts you going on now. Happy birthday for 20 seconds. <laughs> I like the one because, you know, of course, now there's memes all over the place on what you can sing instead of happy birthday for 20 seconds. And the best one is, <laughs> I said this to you, Carol. Wash, wash, wash. I'm a little bit, I'm a, I have, wait, what is it? I have a Lamborghini driving in I'm my car. <laughs> I'm a little bit tipsy when he drives me car. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so it was gross. And the second time around, I fast forward. Um, he nods, to, <laughs> he nods to his brother and apparently that means he wants to stay while he gets his surgery. I know. Well, he would, Josiah was funny too, because they, they pan over to him as all this is happening. And he's like, you can tell, he's like, I'm going to live with the sore throat. It's all good. Yeah. It's all yeah. good. It's yeah. all good. Wow. Dr. Dr. Uh, you know, Welby or whatever your name is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good. Medicine We're woman. <laughs> so, um, Yeah. Dr. So Quinn, yeah. Kezzy, like, just, like, does this. <laughs> and he's like, oh, he just said that he doesn't want to leave because he wants to be here with me <laughs> while I have my surgery. And I'm like, wow, these two have a language. Um, okay, so now we pan back to Roger, and he's standing at the fireplace with Jem, and he's trying to make Jemmy happy. And oopsie, I knocked over this box that sits on the fireplace, on the mantle, every day of my life. There it is, and yet today, I look at it. It's on the mantle, in my own house, every day. <laughs> but today, I'm gonna look. <laughs> oh my God, yes. So everything spills out, and I love how he's throwing the pearl back, get the pearl back in there. So all of a sudden, there's like a little piece of cheese cloth, and he opens it up, and there is a stone. And I know when I see a stone, the first thing I think of is, I bet it's Stephen Buzz. No, he, no, 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 no. He, it's a black diamond. All right, whatever. And he he, had no, I didn't have a problem with that. We all watched the same show of being a wise ass. He had remembered his conversation and his card game with Stephen Bonnet and Stephen Bonnet, and there it was. But I did kind of think it was a little funny that, like, it's this stone that's the exact same one as the one that he shoved back up in his tooth or whatever the hell he was carrying it. Well, I think but, black diamonds are kind of rare. So Stephen, uh, he realizes it's Stephen Bonnet. Well, wait, he remembers okay, can I back up for a minute? Because there was an interest, that card game was very interesting. I didn't guess it yet. It showed us something else that Roger is good at. Do you know what that is? Driving the train? No. He drove a train in that scene? <laughs> Keep going. What is Roger good at? Roger's good at counting cards, my friend. Because he knew that he had eight. <laughs> I'm going to call Roger Rain Man from now on. 
want to take Roger down the escalator. <laughs> Roger's got to go find himself, like, wherever the 18th century Vegas is. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I did think it was kind of funny that Roger doesn't even know what's on the, in the box in his own house. Um, and Brie comes home and tells Roger that she was out looking for mushrooms. She wants to make soup. He confronts her and, <laughs> ooh, child, all hell breaks loose. Um, um, yeah, I loved how they were dressed exactly alike. They're both looking like little, like, you know, 18th century, um, woodland sprites. Yes. She's in her pants. In her pants and her like her little, you know, poofed out jacket. They look ex they they yeah. dress exactly alike. Yes. I didn't notice the alike thing, but that's a good call. Um excuse me. So Bree tells Roger that um oh my god, excuse me you guys, that she did go to see Bonnet and that he was like, Well, I thought you only went to see her cause see him because he was, you know, see him be killed. She's like yeah, I might have gone in there and chit-chatted with him for a little while. <laughs> um, and uh, she says that he gave her the stone. And, and he's like, why'd you keep it? And she's like, well, I hung on to it because it's Jemmy's ticket back. Jemmy can't get back through the stone, so I kept it. And um, <clears throat> it sort of, like, triggers Roger to go, why? Like, why did he give you this stone? Right. So then she's like, well, I kind of, sort of, maybe <laughs> told him that Jemmy was good. Did I do that? Is did what I you do that? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So he is like, what? So they get into it. Um, that was a good scene. It was a great scene. It was a very and good scene. Roger gets her to admit without saying so, but she's kind of thinking that he might be the father. Because she doesn't say, but he's like, which one do you think? And she's like... Uh, well, no, I mean, to, no, to be fair, she was like, I didn't think you wanted, I didn't think I had to tell you, or I, I didn't think you needed to know, or not, not needed to know, she he he's something like you he says something like you you know you're not you're not killed telling me and she's like i didn't think you want you you needed to be reassured right um and that was that was a good comeback that was a good comeback right. but i mean right. you know brie like there's i would think you'd know enough to be like it doesn't matter uh, you're his father whatever because right. i mean she we was. both like like they both know about how biology works they both know at this point there is a chance that Bonnet's the father. And what Bree needs to do in this situation is diffuse it by saying, I don't care who's the biological father. You're right. Jemmy's father. Right. And it, it amazes you. Like, why does she know that? So, like, I mean, I'm I can see amazing. where he's upset because she, dil she still does seem to have, like, some wacko attachment to him, to Bonnet. And, I mean, he's hot as fuck, so, like... Sorry. <laughs> well, oh, I don't find him attractive in this at all. You know, this season he's not as attractive. I ain't gonna lie. I mean, even even back to being old Bonnet, before we really saw him do anything nasty when he's on the ship with Roger. I, yeah, I don't know. It's just something about him. I don't know. Maybe I'm get, maybe I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. In something else, I would find him attractive in this. No. Um. <clears throat> He's just such a sociopath that it freaks me out really bad. But um, so then Roger gets all mad. But I did like the fact that when he asks her, who do you think is a father? She doesn't say. And obviously she doesn't know. But it's kind of like she's like. Right. Without saying so, she thinks Bonnet. Right. So I, I feel like maybe you might want to hold Jemmy up in front of you, Roger, and take a look at him. And that'll <laughs> help. Um, so Roger grabs his gun, takes off in a hop. So now we're back to Claire sitting in church and the priest comes over and we realize for sure that Graham is the patient who died from the allergic reaction to penicillin. Yeah. And she has a very lovely conversation with the priest. Um, who seems very and, familiar. Is it just me or is he, has he been in stuff before? I was too having to turn it off again and cry. So I really didn't pay much attention to the priest. So I don't know. But his comment to her was outside the love God has for his children. 
that sort of devotion between man and wife, there's nothing like it. So of course I'm like, turn it off. I'll be back. This is why it took me two days. To get to do that, so. um, but I did think it was really lovely that they had that nice conversation. Um, I was just thinking about high school when I lost a friend and I was really upset. And my friends were like, go talk to the priest. And I went to talk to the priest and he kind of gave me some flip answers. And I was like, dude, you're not making me feel better at all. So I'm like, why can't I have that conversation with the priest in the pew? Claire always um, has really good conversations with priests. I mean, and still she, to this day, I will say that the conversation with Father Anselm, that's his name, um, in Outlander is my favorite part of Outlander. Yeah. Well, I think to have a good conversation, I need to go see Father Dave at St. Martha's because he's serving Jesus. So, um I just think he's like a way cool dude. You guys, I'm not even kidding. This priest is really young and he has longish hair and he looks like Jesus. So you could, um, dig up Father Lalazern too from when we were growing up. Loved Father Lalazern. Oh yeah. The, the, the priest that I was trying to talk to in high school who everyone said, go speak with him. Yeah. He ended up um, being part of that whole Philadelphia arrest thing because he covered up molestation. Um, it's... and then he was released. And then there were all the kinds of people who were mad that he was released and all kinds of stuff. Anyway. Um, don't even want to get into that. You don't want to get Carol started on, on any of that. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I have, and Carol's crying again and Claire's thinking of Jamie. No one's lost. Who's not forgotten. Um, and then I have F off. What is with that happy horse shit, Padre? <laughs> it was like this lovely thing that he said and he walks away and I'm like, Oh, no one's lost. Oh, screw it. <laughs> So, um, Claire's okay. hair was also really big in the scene. Oh, huge. It was like Patsy's. Yeah. You guys will show you a picture. I have that picture. Oh, uh, I think I put it up here before. Okay. So we see Roger sitting in the woods and he gets quite a start when he hears somebody rustling around and it's Claire coming right on out of the woods. Cause that's what Claire does. She just appears. Right. You no, know? where at? She's one of so, like the, the fairies or, um, the yeah. folk. Right. But today she's looking for a golden seal. Okay, because golden seal is very helpful. I remember people used to take that. I'm trying to remember. I'm like, isn't that what they used to take so that their pee, if they had like a new job and they had to have a urine sample, then it would did, be golden. Didn't show like like cannabis and would seal um, in all the drugs they did. Yeah. <laughs> so I have perhaps she's been smoking pot and needs to cover the pee. Um, they have a chat about Bree. And, um, <clears throat> and Jen and Claire explains that it didn't matter when Bree was growing up that she didn't know about Jamie because she had two parents who made her feel safe and loved. And I thought that was great. Yeah, so, that was very nice. Any Roger and Claire scene is fine by me. Have well, they one, understand each other. You know what I mean? They, like they're they, kind of yes, yes. They respect each other. I think they have a special bond. Um, the two actors are just so good together. Yeah. They have a nice, yeah. <clears throat> a nice chemistry. Um, <clears throat> no, I think that they really, they have a very special relationship, the two of them. They do. And they bounce like really well off yeah. each other. But so they're having their nice little mother-in-law, son-in-law chit chat. And, um, she tells him not to be careless with the time he has with Bree. So basically she's like, listen, you like, stop worrying about nonsense. There's no reason to worry about this. Um, and so um, <clears throat> Roger comes home and Bree is seeing, um, and Bree is seeing, oh, sewing. <laughs> Bree's sitting there sewing and he comes back, uh, tells her that he found the mushrooms that she couldn't find the other day. And he even went across the creek to go find them. She should have uh, been like, nya, 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 nya. I can do something you can't. Ha, I'm not so dumb after all. <laughs> yeah. He's getting across the creek to get those shoes. <laughs> um, make your suit. Get in there and make my suit, woman. <laughs> <laughs> when you finish sewing my shirt. Um, she tells him at this point that Bonnet is still alive. You know, there was one thing. Sorry, I'm trying to claw, unclog my ears. Um, there was one thing that I felt was very, like, I didn't, like, like of course they're not going to have it, but, because he just came out of the woods and he left all night and he's been upset or whatever, but I thought to myself, is anyone going to mention the fact that she's known about this since the wedding and she didn't tell him? 
But she doesn't want to. She didn't want to say anything. I guess she didn't want to tell Roger. She didn't want right. to dredge. Him I up. mean, I don't think she told anybody. Did she? Uh, I don't know. I guess not. No, no. But he's her husband, and she should tell him. End of story. So um, <clears throat> she um, tells him Bonnet's still alive, and then an Irishman gave Jemmy a coin at Cross Creek, and Roger's like, "Oh, come on! It could have been anyone." And she's like, "Yeah, Lord John confirmed at the wedding." that others have seen Bonnet. Right. That's when, when she's given him all of this, I'm like, if I were Roger, I'd be like, and you didn't think to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, um, oh, I have, and Roger's reaction is Oscar worthy. Okay, Emmy worthy. Roger is like, you gotta look at his face, you guys. Go back and watch the scene and look at Roger's face. And I'm like, oh my God, he's just so good. So, um, yeah, so they have a lovely little talk about the whole situation. And basically now they know that, you know, yeah, he's still alive and this is going to be a problem. And then Roger is like, you know what? Let's take the gem and get our gem and go right on back through the stones and go back to our own time. Because this is a bunch of bullshit right here. And I'm sick of camping out in the woods with my gun that I don't even know. <laughs> oh, how funny, was, how funny was he when Claire came out of the woods? And he was like, it's okay, I would have missed you anyway. <laughs> oh my gosh, now I have one ear clogged and one ear not. And I'm having like uh, allergy attack. This is just, it's allergy season. That's the other thing with the coronavirus being now, because everybody has allergies out. too. Like, And that's why I told you, I went to the doctor and they were like, yeah, you don't have a fever and this is your allergies. And I have bad allergies. So, right. Right. Um, so, um, okay. So Jamie and I have literally, I've given up and I'm like, and what's his name? And lefty, Knox, but, lefty. Why was he lefty again? I forgot. Because he's lieutenant. Mm. All right. So Jamie and lefty. To think of lefty. I couldn't think of his last name either. The whole time I was watching Jamie it. Jamie and douchey lefty, what's his name, Knox, um, are chatting. And um, <clears throat> Jamie's, you know, putting it on that, you know, he's okay with, still looking for Murtaugh, you know. Um, you know, it's okay he's still being hunted. Um, but he's obviously agitated at the whole thing. Right. Um, and then he gets asked to take the paperwork um, absolving the regulators to the regulators who are west of... Excuse me. West the of... Ridge. No, he said it. Anyways, doesn't matter. So he's basically like, uh, Jamie, yeah, you're trotting off back down to the ridge. So you take these papers and drop them off. And Jamie's like, hello, I'm not a sheriff. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, but you are a Scot. And a lot of the regulars are Scots. So they're going to like you a lot better than me and my bad ponytail. So they're like, all right, that's what we're going to do. You take everything. So um, I have to insert something here. Are you done talking about him? Because I have, I have something that you will never get, but maybe some people who will watch this will. And I know, like, our friends over at the Outlander podcast, Ginger and Summer, will be talking about, I will have to make a point to listen to their recap of this episode, because they will make a point of this. Because it was so, it was such a huge, huge, huge metaphor for the rest of this episode. At one point... Lefty's like, you know, they're there. Jamie and Lefty always talk philosophy. Their discussions are always philosophical. They're always about honor and morals and ethics and whatever. Um, and at one point, Lefty's like, you know, they're talking about, <clears throat> talking about the benefits of doing right. And he says, and I quote, those that follow the path of the righteous shall have their reward. At first, dumb me was like, wait, is that that quote from, um, is that what Samuel L. Jackson says in Pulp Fiction? Looked it up, whatever. I was like, I know that quote. I know that quote. <laughs> but, and, and he talks about the righteous, um, but it's not that. It, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different thing. Did we end up using that passage at Tom's No, but we do, you guys, when I, see, we've talked about this before, how, our, this is that our family never met a tragedy or a sad moment that we wouldn't drive a truck of humor through. The, <laughs> the damn day, the day after Tom dies, 
And we are like, you know, people are like trying to like find readings and stuff for the funeral. We literally were like, could we use, <laughs> could, we, could we get that speech in there, in there some way as a reading? Is there any way to do that as a reading? You guys. And we literally watched, looked it up. He watched Pulp Fiction on hospice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Eight days of us. He kicked us all out, said he was all mad at me and said he had to go to sleep and we leave and I'm all nervous and I get back in the morning and he's happy as a clam and I'm like, not happy, not happy as a clam. He's okay. And I'm like, did you get sleep last night? Did you sleep when we left? And he's like, nah, I watch Pulp Fiction. Um, and I'm like, oh, I'm kicking kick me. This is just, it doesn't matter. Even you guys, even on hospice, they still are like, oh, get out of here. <laughs> oh, watch my movie now. No, but we looked it up. We looked up that passage and it was still too, because we were like, well, maybe it's not this bad, like actually in the Bible <laughs> and we can slip it in somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And I will rain down. <laughs> no, it's pretty violent. <laughs> in the Bible and, and we tried to do it, but it was really like, it's, and they changed it. They changed it for the movie. The actual, it's full of like anger and like. Right, right. Yeah. So, so it was not used. Violent. It was not used in the funeral, but, yeah. um, but it was a really funny yeah. moment when we were at, when it was actually happening. But no, so I realized what it's from. It's totally from, you're never going to know, audience, Flame is Rob. All to follow the path of the righteous shall have their reward. And then it became really clear to me, Lefty is Javert from Les Miserables. Now, Carol's going to tune out here because she's never seen Les, Les Miserables. Did you see the movie? I not only have I seen Les Miserables, I took Tom. No, Tom took me for my birthday and we went into the city and saw Les Mis. Oh, really? Oh, well, then you do get Les Mis. Mis. So there's a, there's a, now, now I'm feeling um, close again. So I'm taking all my rings off. Um, there's a song. Okay. So, you know, Javert, there's, there's two foils in the show. There's Jean Valjean, who is the lead, who is... We call him Jean Valjean. <laughs> this is bringing out funny Tom stuff that you don't even know about. I can totally... Oh, my God. If I, Nothing surprises me less than to, to, to hear, like, Tom called him Jean Valjean. <laughs> he insisted the same way that he calls Rafe Fines Ralph. Ralph. <laughs> you guys, I'm sorry I keep doing this, but... Uh, he insisted on refer. He would not refer to Ray Fine. As Ray. He was like, his name is Ralph. I don't care what he wants to call himself. Um, okay, Jean Valjean. It's really Jean Valjean. Sorry, Tom. Um, but he's he is he he gets put into prison for twenty years because he stole a loaf of bread to feed his family. Um, he is a a righteous person. Um, and then on the other side, you have. And he he breaks his parole, so he's sort of he's sort of a a, a in in uh, a fugitive running, as they say in the show. And then on the other side, you have Javert, who is an inspector, like a police officer, who is charged with um, finding Jean Valjean, and is equally ethical, but has his own belief of the law. The law. The law is what guides your life. Um, Jean Valjean is just as ethical, but his, his rules or morals are more about, um, what's good for everyone, if that's even making any sense. But so at one point, Javert has a song called Stars, which is basically his, um, his ethical beliefs, which is, um... Your way, my way is the law, and have their reward. And if it fall as Lucifer fell, but anyway, that's a that's a line from the song. Um, Those that follow the path of the righteous shall have their reward. And from that moment on, like Lefty, I I saw him in a whole different light. He is Javert. This whole idea of the, the honor and following the law and doing what is right and doing what is, what is lawful. And that is 
that is what you do. King and country. That is so Javert. Um, I don't know if these the writers in the writers' room like came up with this concept and were like, oh my god, it's brilliant, but it kind of is. Um, it got to be a little heavy handed, and that was that was really like that was that was pretty 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 big a pretty big t shirt that says this he is like a Javert character, but. Um, I, I loved it. I thought it was very, very good. And it made me like, oh, totally makes sense. I like the fact that, I mean, Jamie's usually like, you have to do what's right. But he's, but, but he's all, he is, he, Jamie and, and Lefty are Valjean and Javert. And we'll get to the whole idea of like committing a crime for the greater good. Because that's coming up in a few minutes, and we'll, i got to stay awake to talk about that. Um, but, I mean, Jean Valjean does that. He commits a crime that gets him impr- imprisoned for 20 years because his family is starving. He steals a loaf of bread. Um, and, and, and Javert doesn't want to hear about it. That's against the law. You are bad. And the lefty is the same way. It's really, oh, it, it, the, the parallels are very, very, very interesting. I think it was my 22nd birthday. That's not Tom where you got engaged, was it? No, I was turning 24 on the 24th. Um, I think it was my 22nd birthday. You guys, my birthday's the day before Christmas. So it was the day before that. It was the 23rd. And we went into the city. And you guys, I'm like this practically a country bumpkin from Pennsylvania. And, you know, Tom lived in North Jersey and was cool and zipped into New York City. And I was like, yay, this is so cool. And we went out to dinner and then we went to the show. And then we found some little pub and we're all dressed up. And we found this little Irish pub in New York City and sat down, tiny little place, you know, have some whatever I was drinking at the time, beers, whatever. And then next thing you know, you know, when two people who are pretty tipsy are having like a serious conversation and Tom's like, Cap, what do you think that show was about? And I'm like, never, ever steal a loaf of bread. (laughs) (laughs) And he would say that to me periodically, Cap. Never steal a loaf of bread. I have to um, ask, so- an aside, he really didn't like Les Mis, did he? Uh, I cried. I remember that. He was like, mm-hmm. he, he, I mean, that's not a Tom you, If you said that to him, he'd be like, Tracy, Tracy, you make me sound like an ogre. He didn't, you know, he wasn't like, oh my God, I hate this so much, like the girl with the pearl earring. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, it, you know, it wasn't one of his favorites. I took him to Tommy because he was a Ooh, huge Pete Townsend fan. I like that fan. too. Yeah. Yeah. So he was a big um, Pete Townsend fan. So I took him to see Tommy. So anyway. Okay. So can I move on? Yes. That's, I need All to right. make that point though. Okay. So Graham, we're back to the hospital room and Graham is telling Claire that he has to watch the Blessed Sacrament. Um, he's done it ever since his wife died and he... Um, uh, God, God, I was like, wow, like this guy, I feel bad. I, I, he, I'm going to Scotland <laughs> and he was like, Oh, she's buried here. I can't, I can't ever leave her. I can't, that time that ship has sailed. I can't go back to Scotland to, even for a visit. My wife is buried here and I just, I just can't leave her. And I'm like, Oh my God, I feel bad because I would just totally like, you know, take off or like, <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. America. Mom in my grief group who, as Tracy and I have told you guys, like, I'm sorry, but the way to get through grief for me is humor, irreverent as possible. There is a mom in my grief group whose husband's name was Pete and she has a little bit of his ashes in a container in the car and they call it car Pete. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is what widows and widowers do ourselves saying I think that's funny all right so because I was thinking to myself well I would just take the ashes with me if I really wanted to go and but she's buried so he felt like he couldn't leave her and I right. that. um 
Okay, so Jamie uh, shows up to see Lefty and brings him the muster roll with every man, the name of every man who bent the A for him. And um, he asks him to play one more game of chess before he goes. I'm like, dude, that's like Lord John's thing. You back it up. <laughs> so listen, Jack. Only Lord John is allowed to play chess with Jamie. Yeah, I was like, oh my God, you're such a wannabe. <laughs> so, um, they play chess, and then we go to Claire finding out that um, poor Graham has passed away. She's yelling and screaming at the new girl. And the new girl says that she, he had an anaphylactic rec, um, response to uh, reaction to the penicillin. And, you know, why wasn't I notified? And she awkwardly, like, slam drops the, the clipboard. That would have been really great if the nurse had been like, yeah, I don't know. Like, somebody gave him penicillin, like, and he was totally allergic to it and had an anaphylactic yeah. shock and died. Like, who would have been yeah. that dumb? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, then I'd like to see what Claire would have said. Yeah, Claire was not happy that nobody called her. So, um, uh, yeah, so she gets mad, drops the clipboard, uh, goes to the bar to drown her sorrows like the rest of us, um, and walks and in walks Joe Abernathy and sees her sitting there with her little pirate novel. Um, <clears throat> So we know that she grabbed it because she's really been missing Jamie. Graham Menzies really was, like, bringing back her Jamie time. Right. And the, the love of the two of them, the bond um, that can never be broken. And, oh, my God, here we go again. That time number four, cry number four. So basically she's talking about, you know, um, <sighs> you know, basically knowing that this bond between – a married couple is just so amazing and can never be broken and death's never going to end. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so, um, sorry. So uh, she talks about all this and Joe makes I'm her feel good. better. And I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Um, <clears throat> So, um, Joe Abernathy sees her pirate novel, blah, 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 she's missing Jamie and his hot manness. She tells Joe that she let herself get too close to Graham. Um, and he's a patient. She shouldn't do that. And, um, and we all know that it's because she missed Jamie and he really, you know, everything he said about him, his wife and, and just his accent and it all brought it all back. And I totally could relate right. to that. Well, even I, when, before when she was talking to Graham, um, in the hospital, and she was like, you remind me of someone I met in Scotland long ago. Yeah. And you just knew. Like, you knew she was what she was talking about. Yeah. Unless she, he really reminded her of Murta or, you know, Dougal or somebody. But I don't think so. And then he said, like, my God, I've been here 20 years and they still can't understand what I'm saying. Right. Um, so we know that she's missing Jamie. Um, and so Joe tells her the problem isn't in the brain. The problem is in the heart. Joe always is there knowing the right thing. Joe to knows just what to say. Joe always knows. Joe knows. Joe knows. Joe um, knows. It was, I mean, I, I don't know if that conversation was from the book. I think it was, but the whole, that whole book thing. Well, we said that at the beginning. That's all. That's how they meet. It's, um, it's that, that's all from the book. Right. The book exchange. So then we're back to Lefty and Jamie, and Lefty tells Jamie over chess um, <clears throat> that if it had, if they had gone to battle, there's no other man he wanted his side. Um, which who hasn't said that to James? I know, right, Frenzy Fraser, duh. Um, and can you tell like Lefty bugged the crap out of me? The chess game is giving me Lord John. I have um, Lefty tells Jamie that they'll see justice done. And he knows that Jamie agrees that men like Murta never change. See, I'm telling you, this is all Les Mis lyrics. Every last line from and Lefty's mouth. And you're sitting here watching, like, Jamie just, like, boil. like, um, And the, the, the kid shows up with the transcript from the Arts Mirror prison roll. And um, Jamie's like, uh. Oh, <laughs> so Jamie says, you'll see my name. Um, 
there's uh, no he says you're you're gonna see my name when you look up on that role and he says um do she's like yeah i'm sure there's more than one james fraser fraser and jamie says but only one from rock to rock and that was so bad and um lefty uh reads the letter because he's in horror right now and sees it and realizes murtaugh is a fraser so um he calls Jamie a traitor and Jamie totally tells him off and they're sort of going back and forth. Now, I don't know if you want to get into the exact um, commentary. I just have words are exchanged no, about I, you know, no. honor think- and being good man. I have, and Jamie killed him. <laughs> so you can see that coming a mile away and you kind of know that Jamie sort of knew when he went there, like probably had it in his head, like, I don't know how this is going to go down. I don't know what's going to happen. You think so? You think yes. Jamie went in there with the intent that he's going to kill him? No, I didn't say that. I think that Jamie went in there not knowing what was going to go down. Jamie went in there thinking, I, I have no idea how this is going to end. Um, so uh, Jamie, unfortunately, has to kill him. And that's really, that's a tough one. That's I, a tough but one. Can we talk that through a little bit? I know it's late, yeah. Um, yeah. but... I don't know how I feel about that. That is this that is not from the book, y'all. That this is a new one for us. And I thought it was going to go down. I mean, they were talking so much about, you know, Lefty and his little incident in the other jail that I thought there was going to be some sort of blackmail involved. That's what I thought. I thought that Lefty was going to find out Jamie was going to say if you tell anybody this, um I will ruin you because I will I will go to Tryon and let him know that you killed somebody, you know, illegally or whatever. Um, and Tryon loves me, but she does. Yeah. And um, Eng- he'll never believe oh, you uh, and you'll be screwed. And I English- would think that, and it would be an interesting conflict for Lefty because Lefty's all about doing the right thing, doing what is lawful and what is what is, you know, morally right. But in the end, the, 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 the allure of career and success would win out over doing the ethical right thing, which would be turning Jamie in and he would keep quiet. That's where I kind of thought it would go just because again, their whole relationship has been this whole philosophical discussion about ethics and morality and whatever. And it would be interesting to see lefty in the end, you know, sell out his soul to, for his career. That didn't happen. (laughs) I think that if it was a matter of Jamie doesn't know Murtaugh, but lets him go, let's say Jamie let Murtaugh go. I could see Wait, him resolve. Wait, I don't understand. What do you mean? Let's say that, hypothetically, that like somehow they came upon Murtaugh and Jamie just like did something and let Murtaugh go. Okay. That I could see that scenario with blackmail or whatever. But if they go to Tryon and say, okay, Lefty killed a Scottish regulator... Because he got a little hot under the collar. Right. But Jamie is the godson of the guy you all know. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, okay. And, and, but, but, Jamie, and Jamie let regulators go in the jail because... Well, Leslie doesn't know that. Hang though. on a minute. Hang on a minute, please. Because of this ruse and the entire thing for weeks, months, has been a ruse... They're too completely. I don't think, but I don't think you can prove that. I mean, they don't know that Jamie let those it, guys go. They don't know yeah. any of that. Jamie could just as easily come back with like, "I hate Mertz. Yes, Mertz is my godfather, but I haven't spoken to him in years, and he, you know, screwed over our family, and he's a, you know, he's dead to me. I want to, I want to take him down just as badly as you do." Yeah, Jamie could, and Jamie could have talked his way out of it. Um, I, I don't. I don't know how this I is going to feed in. I think I've been too exhausted mentally this week to really process this all. Honestly, that's my answer. Because in a lot of ways, what Jamie did was cold-blooded murder. It was. 
And I, I don't know how well that's sitting with me. No, no. And you're sure you looked it up? I don't remember. I, I looked up, I mean, I couldn't find, first of all, I mean, the big problem is I can never remember his name, Knox. And I'm not sure it was Knox in the books. Um, but I have searched Fiery Cross around to see what happens to him. And I yeah. don't think anything happens to him. I think Jamie, I think, you know, Jamie goes off. He, he, he tells Jamie to go to Brownsville. And then they come home, and I'm not sure you see him again. I don't, I don't know. But Jamie doesn't. I mean, I can't think of a time in the books where Jamie kills somebody in cold blood. No. Just to save his his reputation. His <laughs> to save his own ass. I mean, I, I can't either. I mean, Dougal, maybe. I would have rathered if uh, Do- Dougal's me- probably Dougal. Is, oh, I'm sorry, but Dougal probably is because that was the whole thing too. That Dougal found out. I don't remember exactly what he found out either. Um, oh, oh, du- no! What? What? Why did Jamie kill Dougal again? <laughs> Do you remember? They were up in the the uh, building in Culloden. Right. I don't remember it being cold blooded murder. <laughs> maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe Jamie. Maybe Jamie had to do it because he he was like it was self defense. I, I mean, would have rather seen Jamie accidentally kill the guy. Like, wait, we have to talk about this, and then something happens, and you know what or, I mean. And that probably would have been a little cliche. Right. Right. But I, I mean, would have rathered a little cliche over James Alexander, Malcolm McKenzie, Fraser, just killing the guy. Yeah. That's yeah, it. it's really that's not, not his character. It's and, not- and not even, and no remorse. And yes. They, yes. They, agreed. They showed zero remorse. To me, it was like terrorist mentality. Like, oh, this is war. Like, I'm just going to, like, no, I didn't like it. I didn't like that. I did not like that, but it is. 11:39, so we need to wrap this up. I know, I know, I know, I know. But I'm. But this is like really the, the thing I want to talk about the most. Um, maybe we should have started with that. I don't know. I'm gonna be really curious. Let us know what what you guys think in the comments. But I'm gonna be super curious to hear what people have to say about this. Um, yeah. I just don't think I don't. Part of me is like, okay, he didn't do anything like this in the books. Maybe in the books he just wasn't like he wasn't he wasn't like forced to make this decision, and the fact is that he's forced to make it here. He's forced to make it here. If he is caught, you know he knows what's at stake. Not just you know his life or Claire's life or the Ridge or whatever, but could very well be, you know, what happens in the future. And maybe the stakes are just too high, but but then I but then I flip back and I'm like, no, I just I don't think that he would. I don't think Jamie has it in him to kill somebody in cold blood like that. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. It's not him. It's not him at all. This would never have happened. I will be curious to see what Diana has to say about it. Um, <laughs> Pull out the book and see exactly what went down because this is just. I know it would be really hilarious if that's really. We are happened. belaboring. We are belaboring the point at this point. Um, so I, I, I'm also torn about what happens next. Like on the one hand, I'm like, oh my god, not only did he murder the guy in cold blood, but he totally covered it up, and like, ew, but ew, David. But on the other hand, it was Brills. <laughs> <laughs> he, he totally burns the. Uh, the list of the arts in your list. Right. And then like you see it come over his face like, hey, I'm just going to close the flu. And he closes the flu and he t- takes off out the window. And next thing you know, he burns, um, he, or he smokes fills the room and they all think the guy died of smoke inhalation. Right. They all bring the guy out and they just think that he, you know, he takes his shoes off and his clothes off and he puts them in bed with a blanket and they all think, oh, what a bummer. Like his, which I thought to myself, I'm sorry, in the, I'm not going to say there was never a fire in the 18th century, and I'm not going to say anyone never left a flu closed. But 
yeah. I guess like maybe you would do it if you were drunk. Like this is the, this is what they this is what they did. Like they had a fire every every second of every day. You right. Know what I mean? like, How is the flu? I mean, maybe the flu could close by accident. Maybe that was yeah. I don't know. So that was interesting. But um, you know, they're never going to question his death because because it was it looked totally like right. oops. Right. Right. So um, and I said that I love the Outlander caper fiddle music as Jamie's climbing out the window. Right. Um, it but like, it's like not a cape. It's still, it's still too like, it's still too serious. And so, um, yeah, but I did love the, the music. I did, even though it didn't really fit as much because they made it fun. And I was also thinking, cause then Fergus shows up and I'm thinking to myself, God, if this was like, the fun kind of feeling of the book when Jamie never killed anyone in cold blood. Um, <laughs> Fergus would have been in there with him. They would have been carrying the guy together. <laughs> Fergus would have set the whole thing up. Or Jamie would have gone, and Fergus would have come up and been like, we love you go. I'll take care of you. you know? So like, I, but anyway, so Jamie comes out and sees cutie pie ads though. Um, and take him for Claire. And I just thought that was the cutest thing ever. I loved it. I love, love, loved it. I was like, it's awesome. I know. It was so cute. Um, and then I have Fergus swing for Jamie and off they go. And Jamie rides up to the big house and sort of stops and like looks at it like, I have made fun. <laughs> like, is, look what I have done. <clears throat> look what I have created. Look what I have created. So um, he rides up to the big house, takes a look. And then um, rides closer to where Claire and everybody are. Claire is outside with everybody doing the yard work and then doing her gardening. They kiss. I'm thinking, oh, Lord, his breath must be bad. Um, <laughs> Jamie gives ads out to Claire for a saucer, a saucer of milk. Um, Brie and Claire are walking back in the 60s and discussing going to London for a visit. And Brie's, like, at this point, not really 100% on board because she's like, what about my summer classes? Yeah. What about my I have, I have my, my finals. And she's like, well, after your finals. And she's like, well, like, you know, basically like thinking like, oh, what, you're going to go with me? Because, you know, she and Claire didn't always really get along. Right. Claire worked a lot. So Claire's like, yeah, I took a leave of absence. She's like, oh, sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> so Claire's like, yeah, Brie, and it's really important to me that uh, we do this. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, she says like, listen, your father wanted you to take you, wanted to take you to London before he died. And she says like, can I take you? And I, I related to that a thousand percent because I got a lot of that going on in my house right now where like, sorry, you're stuck with me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it sucks. But I, I, I really liked the way they did that. So, and I like that you could sort of see Brie like coming along, like, you know, all right. Right. Um, I also liked Brie, like it really... It, and this is props to Sophie Skelton. Like, Brie just seemed younger then, even though that they just, I mean, they, I know. they didn't, there was, there was a, a sense of age dis, um, difference between the Brie from 1968 and the now Brie. You can tell the now Brie has really grown and experienced more than that kind of bratty right. Brie. Right. They, they pulled a piece of hair back. And it like did wonders for making her look younger. Um, Claire gives ads out his milk and she kisses Jamie and um, I have Jamie's looking hot in that coat. Um, says that he has much to tell her, which we all know, like, oh yes, you do. Mm -hmm. um, you can tell her about the cold blooded murder. <laughs> she tells him about Graham and explain and it's like, Jamie, do you remember that? Graham, I told you about. And I'm like thinking to myself, he remembered? Like, like, how many stories has she told him? I know. Um, then Gra that um, she tells him about Graham and explains that Graham is the reason why she found her way back to him because Graham, um, you know, died and reminded her so much of him, got her thinking, and that's why she decided to take Bree back to London. And then when they were in London, they found out about um, Reverend McKenzie. Wakefield. Yeah. Oh, Wakefield and passing away. I know that sounded wrong. You can't remember McKenzie. <laughs> and that, that's uh, Roger. And so they said, okay, um, <clears throat> that's why they, that's how they knew about it. And that's why they went to Scotland. Right. 
Right. And and the, and that's why they met Roger and Roger helped them out to find Jamie and the rest is history. Right. So exactly. um and I have um explains Graham as the reason why she found her way back to Jamie and I have and I cry like a baby. <laughs> like a baby? <laughs> like a baby. <laughs> the end. Paint to black. Um yeah, it was, I mean, it was, I felt like it was a really well-written episode. I felt like it was really well put together. Um, I, like I said, I loved that it was, it was focused on the Ridge and on the characters we really love and care about and their relationships. But boy, this Jamie and cold-blooded murder business. Whew. I don't know. Like I said, it's just, a, it's, it's been a really weird mind-sucking week so maybe that's not why I that maybe that's why I feel like I haven't been like what the with that yeah. I have to look it up though because I have this bad feeling that we're gonna look it up and be like oh wait it did sort of happen like this I mean what I'm thinking is he might have he might have murdered I'm well he's clearly killed other people before but I don't know that he's ever like murdered somebody like that for his just so that he you know not, not, not necessarily to, to, to save his own skin, you know? And, yeah. and again, we don't know that he could, I mean, was there something else he could have done? If that was presented in that way, you need to study up on Jamie Fraser a little bit. That's I mean, how I feel. Wait, I don't understand. Say that again. If you're going to present Jamie Fraser in that way, you don't understand Jamie Fraser. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't, I just really don't think he would, I mean. But again, I have to go read it because I could be totally wrong. I have been, I've tried to find it a little bit and I don't, and I don't, I have not been able to find it. So I will be. If it happened, he would have been so remorseful and it would have been, I could see a my neck or your neck, but other different circumstances. Yes. You're right. Like he, when he, after he did it, he was just like, he wasn't like, oh my God, what have I done? Or I'm so sorry I had to do that. I mean, he was more sorry about having to kill, you know, Mr. Crazy Town in uh, two episodes ago. He felt really bad about that. This lefty, he was just kind of like, I mean, I don't, he wasn't quite like, but it was kind of like, okay, I just did that. Now I need to like, you know, cover my tracks. Do you think that maybe he felt like Lefty executed a man without trial? Um, so he got his... No. No. I think he thought Lefty is going to oh, yeah. screw my chances of... Uh, Lefty, Lefty is going to screw things up for me. But no. I don't think the worry was for himself as much as it was for Murtaugh. No, it was for himself because he found out, like, because Lefty found found out. And now Jamie was going to be, you know, brought up. For, I mean, think about it. Think about, okay, okay. I think I I just thought of a way. I just thought of something. Okay, we, this is, how long are we going right now? I don't, I can't tell, but, but this will be it. What do you mean you can't tell? You can always tell. You tell me all the time. 149, but I don't know how long it was running before that. Then we will go. Let, and and this involves the whole like Claire. If this didn't happen, then this wouldn't happen. Then this wouldn't happen. If Lefty had gone to try and and reported Jamie and said they he really is like related to Murta Fitzgibbons and you know they're all besties and whatnot. Jamie would have lost the land or that tr- the the agreement that he had with with. That would have been at stake. And then all of these people who live on the ridge, who depend on Jamie, would have been lost. They would have lost everything. So Jamie was, in a sense, protecting all of that. True. It just didn't really come off that way. It came off more as like, your, you know, Martha Fitzgibbons is, uh, um, you know, is your godfather. You're a traitor of the crown, and I'm gonna like report you. No, no, please don't. 
it, there, there, I, there wasn't, you know, you really have to tease out that larger impact. And right. if you think about the larger impact, then maybe you get to a place where you're like, Jamie had to do that in order because he, be, Jamie, Jamie becomes more of the Jean Valjean and less of the, you know, Ted Bundy. Right. Um, committing a crime for the greater good. I'm not quite there yet, though, but that helps. That definitely helps. Um, so, I don't know. I gotta read it, because I, I, I have this feeling that people are gonna be like, yes, it's exactly how it happens in the book. <laughs> I don't think it is, but you know, that's it's, it's a lot to chew on. You guys, I want to hear what you have to say, because you guys have great things to say. You... Um, con like the, I don't even know how many comments there are right now on last week's episode, but comment, comment, comment. Let us know what you think. Um, also let us know if you're okay. Like, I just worry about everybody. Like, you know, how are you doing? You know, you can like tell us stuff that doesn't have to do with Outlander in the comments too, if right. you want. Right, right. We hope everyone's healthy. Yes, and that you're like all the schools are closing around here. I I was thinking about that. Like, you know. We know what it's like in New Jersey, but I don't know what it's like in Kansas, in Nevada. Like, are all your schools closing down? Are all you working from home? My husband's working from home now for the foreseeable future. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very weird time right now. Um, yes. So, you know, let us know in the comments how you're doing, but also, like, what you thought of this episode. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, please. I see that we're up to over 3,000 subscribers now, which is pretty great. Um, but we want to get it even more, we want to get even I higher. And follow, in the fo beginning. follow us on Twitter if you're not already, because, um, you know, we could always use followers there. Follow us on Facebook, on Instagram. We're on there too. Um, you know, we're not on TikTok yet, but we'll try to get on that. Oh, fun. One of these days. <laughs> That's, you just have to dance on that, right? Who's going to do that? <laughs> Um, follow us on all those things. Um, and that's it. We will be, uh, you know, uh, coronavirus be damned because coronavirus could never keep us from you guys. We will be back with you all next week. Have a great week. You guys stay healthy, stay cool and wash your hands. Wash them, wash them good. And cough into your sleeve. <laughs> and I'll try to learn how to do it. Okay. See you next week, guys. <laughs>